All right. Yeah, how are you guys doing? What's up, Twitch? What's up, YouTube? <laughs> if you guys don't know me, I'm, I am Kostik Kavutsky. I'm a coach on uh, CoachUs.com. This is like a weekly show that I do every week called Diagnose Your Chess, where we look at games. Uh, in the past, I would work with uh, students kind of like one-on-one -on, -one on the show, and you can um, find previous episodes uh, of that um, on my YouTube channel and on Chess24's YouTube channel. Um, but last week and today, I'm going to continue doing kind of like a new format where I'm actually just going to be doing viewer game analysis. So if anyone has a game that they want to get analyzed uh, on stream, no pressure. You know, you just submit a game, I'll play through it and give you my thoughts on it. Um, that that's what the show is going to be. So, <laughs> all right. So Arrow here is playing white. And Arrow is about 1360 rated. Their opponent named Schliemann Defense, which is pretty funny. Never seen the username just named Schliemann Defense, uh, is rated 1627. And then Arrow was asking, um, I'd love to see how I could maybe have converted this. Okay, great. Yeah, whenever we get like a winning position and then we don't convert, one of the most instructive things is to then analyze exactly what happened and, and see how we could have won the game. Because converting is, of course, uh, a big, big issue. Um, all right, so we got the four knights scotch. I'm just going to briefly play through the game just to get like a general general sense of what happened, and then we'll, we'll uh, talk about it. So h3, queen f3, bishop f4. So far, so good. I mean, we're just developing our pieces here. Knight e2. Is this a plan you're, you've seen before? Knight e2, bring the knight to, uh, to d4 maybe? So that seems quite uh, quite possible. Um, queen b8, b3, c5, c4. I like this move, c4. It's very thematic for this structure. Just kind of fixing black's pawn there on c5. Okay, so takes. Take with the pawn. Queen c7. Trade. Queen g3. Going for a lot of trades. A lot of trades, I'm noticing. <laughs> I would have thought maybe a move like rook eighty one um, would feel very logical here, just lining up against black's queen, threatening this discovered attack with bishop takes h7. Of course, the opponent is not going to fall for that. They're going to move their queen out of the way. Um, but then we're happy we developed our last piece and our rook is on the open file. Maybe from here, our next move might be knight f4, like putting some pressure on, on the bishop. So queen g3 strikes me a little, little unnecessary, actually. I don't know why we necessarily want to go for... Um, the end game here. Uh, but let's see. So rook b8, rook b1, knight d7, bishop f5, knight d6. We take on e6. Rook takes e6. Takes, takes, knight e4. Gotcha, gotcha. So you like end games. Okay. So um, let's break this down. Is this the moment where you feel like you had an advantage, or at what point? Do you feel, did you feel like during the game, like, oh, I have an advantage and I need to convert this? Because basically things uh, liquidated very quickly from here. Rook c8, rook b5 was played, and then we trade, trade, trade. King f7. And uh, around here it looks like, yeah, draw green, and probably a pretty fair result. Like, to me, it looks um, pretty much. Uh, equal at this point. Uh, so if we go back and see maybe where white could have improved, um, we can think about this position because we did kind of leave black with one weakness here. So I like this 94 move, rook c8, and then we kind of liquidate. Oh, right about 94 you realize you didn't have much. Oh, I see. Yeah. Um, well, I mean, to be honest, I think this is this is about as good as white, I think, could have gone in from this endgame. If we go back to this position, let's try to evaluate this position for, for a second when we go into the endgame. My feeling is that white has basically no advantage at this point, and if anyone can argue to be better, it would be black. And the reason for that is that black's bishop on e6 just has this clear target on in the uh, c4 pawn. 
So this is kind of an interesting case. I'm getting the feeling maybe you might have overestimated your position here because I don't actually think white really had um, much, except actually at the final moment, maybe we're like slightly better once we trade some pieces and, and weaken black, uh, black's pawn structure. But at this moment, black is the only one that really has like a target in the position, like an easy target, let's say the C4 pawn. Um, and if anything, actually, I would probably rather be uh, black in this position just because, well, the bishop can hit c4 and maybe we can put pr pressure on this one. And in the meantime, it's not as easy for white to create threats. Basically, white should just be trying to trade pieces, kind of like you did in the game and uh, and equalizing. So I like how you played it, actually. I think you played it uh, really well, actually. I mean, very, very solid. Um, however, we might have misevaluated the, uh, the position. Right, so we might have been a little bit over uh, optimistic about this endgame. Um, but let's see, so bishop f5. And uh, now black lets you take on e6, which you correctly do. And I think this is maybe the only moment where if you don't want a draw, you can actually fight on here. Because now we've traded off the bishops, so both c pawns are kind of weak. And equally weak, I would say. But black has this isolated e pawn that's a very clear weakness as well. And, and white doesn't have a pawn like this. So our structure is, uh, is healthier. Uh, in fact, something that a lot of coaches talk about is like pawn islands. So here white has like three pawn islands. The pawn on a2 is isolated. The pawn on c4 uh, is an island as well. And then we have one pawn island on the king side. These pawns can defend each other. Or we look at uh, black structure, they have the same three pawn islands, and of course, this additional e pawn. So black has kind of one extra weakness in the position. In the game, we end up liquidating very quickly. We go rook b5, going after the c pawn, we trade rooks, and now we get into this knight end game that I would say is very, very equal, because now black has, okay, one small weakness, but the king is very uh, nicely centralized. It's going to come into the center. White's king should come into the center as well, as we do with king f1, king e2, and basically... Neither side should be able to really win this with, with best play. Now, of course, you could continue the game. There's always a chance someone will blunder, someone will hang something. You know, you never know. But uh, objectively, I would say this position is equal. So let's go back. Let's see where we could try to find an improvement for white in this position. Yeah, my feeling is at this point, queen g3, definitely not the right way to go. Um, because in this endgame, we simply have no advantage. There's nothing that we can point to that would say, you know, that white should be better. What would be an example of that? So like a, if the opponent had some clear weakness, we could attack, we can point to that. But in this case, it's only black that can uh, hit the c4 pawn. Um, if the enemy king is like particularly weak and we could attack it, then we could say like, well, the king is still weak. But here, king safety, definitely not an issue for, uh, for black. Another advantage you could try to play on is peace activity. So if you had an endgame, for example, where gonna get the arrows back you were able to get both of your rooks to the seventh rank well then your rooks would be super super active and you would definitely have uh, an advantage in peace activity there because your pieces would be putting a lot of pressure and black would have to defend very very passively and if you apply enough pressure eventually you might get some tactics and be able to to break through but judging from this position black goes rook a b8 and yeah, basically, black has no reason to be worse here, right? If we look at all three of these factors of evaluation, king safety, peace activity, pawn structure, basically, black is at least equal on all fronts. And that should tell us that, well, white should also just be comfortable playing for equality here. And uh, and again, the moves were good. I just have a feeling the evaluation was a little bit off. It seems like we were a little bit like over optimistic here. Um, so what could we have done instead? Yeah, I think I would play this move rook eighty one, like I mentioned earlier, just following general principles of bringing the last piece into the game, and then maybe looking to to play like knight f four at some point, like let's say I don't know queen b six, knight f four, just putting a little bit of pressure on e six, not necessarily going to take, but just trying to improve our position slowly and seeing what the opponent comes up with, because it's not always easy to play these positions. It can be very, very easy to uh, blunder something, especially if you're under a little bit of pressure. And uh, I think we, here in the middle game, we can say that maybe white has some pressure here, like the knight on f4 is kind of a nice and active piece, like we have pressure against this bishop on e6, and uh, black doesn't really have 
a ton of counterplay of their own. So maybe we could say white has a little uh, something here. That was probably still pretty close to equal. But look, this is what you signed up for. I know you mentioned the uh, the keep it simple 1e4 uh, repertoire from Chess Explained. And, you know, we gotta, we got to be clear here. Like Chess Explained, I, I think he makes really good courses. Um, but I think even he would say his courses are not designed to get this like huge advantage out of the opening. His courses are designed to keep it simple, and that means that you're probably going to get a lot of equal or equal-ish positions out of the opening, and then it's up to you to try and outplay your opponent in the middle game. So I, these kinds of courses are not about like winning out of the opening, for example. Not saying that that's what you're trying to do, but just <laughs> so we're all clear. Um, but these courses are about just getting some comfortable position where you're just trying to find a middle game where you can improve your position and put some pressure on the opponent. In these middle games, there is a lot of scope here for um, posing black some problems. The engine will always say it's like completely equal and black has multiple moves in every position, um, but still over the board, it's not that easy to keep things uh, equal. And uh, you can always pose problems for the opponent in almost any position. Uh, if you find the right plan to improve your pieces and, and so on. Um, and so let's take a look at this middle game, see how we could have played it. I mean, to me, knight e2 looks like a perfectly uh, logical move. I know you said you, you might have mixed up the lines here, but I don't think this is really an opening that's kind of about concrete lines. I think there's like a lot of ideas that you can try in here. I mean, knight e2 looks, to me, it looks perfectly um, reasonable. Uh, so let's see, c5 c4. Now, maybe this move uh, might not be best. I actually did like the move earlier, although I'm not sure about the um, the follow-up here, because we are kind of left with this light-squared bishop, and if we compare the bishops, I don't know, it feels like our bishop is just kind of passively defending the pawn. So I would also consider this move, because if we're going to get the structure, then we might as well trade off these bishops. So still just looking at this kind of at face value, I don't know, our queen is slightly more active than the enemy queen, but that's going to change basically next move. Black can bring the queen out, and yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> it looks pretty equal for white here as well. And basically, your opponent played a solid game, like he didn't really give you um, a lot of chances. Okay, another move we can try in this position is rook ad1. Maybe c4, I mean earlier I said I liked it, maybe it's not actually the best move. Maybe we can try rook ad1 here. We have to be careful about c4 though, but it feels like there's going to be some tactics on the d file. Like for example, take, take. Yeah, we can just take on d6, right? Queen takes d6, and then we have our favorite uh, bishop takes h7, winning the game. Maybe rook ad1, maybe that's your improvement um, for the next time if you happen to reach this position. Um, but, uh, well, actually, as a, you know, kind of a larger lesson, I noticed we never really got this rook out <laughs> until until the end game. We played queen g3, and only here we finally played rook ab1. I don't know, maybe we could have gone on the rook out earlier, and that would have been uh, a slightly better way to to put pressure on, on the opponent. Um, okay, Eru, I hope that makes sense. If you have uh, further questions, please feel free to, to let me know. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm going to go and see if I can uh, find another game. Because there's a couple of submissions and I want to try to get through as many as I can. So here we were playing black. Let's flip the board. And this is from round two of the Dojo Rapid Tournament. Oh, cool. So this was, uh, what, 15-5? Yeah, we at Chess Dojo, we do these uh, rapid events once uh, once a week or so. Um, and yeah, let's take a look and see what happened. All right. So we got a Slav player slash Karo Khan. C6. All right. Knight of three, knight of six, e3. And we go into the g6 Slav. Totally reasonable. Okay. a6, b3, knight e4. It should be two. Knight d7. Now white takes on d5. So notice white takes on d5 exactly at this moment. I think this is not not an accident. A lot of players here from the white side, they know that if they take on d5 too early, 
then Black's Knight can come out to c6 and it's more active. So they often wait for the knight to come out to d7 where it's kind of more passive and now they take on d5 at this uh, exact moment. Um, although another option for white would have been to play knight takes e4, d takes e4, and uh, knight d2, kind of go after the pawn this way. Again, what, what would you think about this one? How would you how would you approach this position? Are you playing like knight f6 here? Are you playing f5? I'm not totally sure about the structure. Sometimes this can be a little bit risky because we lose our kind of strong d5 pawn and this pawn on e4 can be a little bit uh, overextended. So we kind of have to be careful about this one sometimes. Yeah, so I don't, I don't know, this 94 plan, is this something you've, uh, I, I have a lot of questions for you. <laughs> is this something you've played before? Is this something that's like part of like an opening course? I'm not really up to date on the theory here. To me, 94 doesn't look like the most natural move. So if this is something like you just came up with over the board, um, then maybe we, we should talk about this one. Because I actually feel like it, it might not be the right way to, to play the position. Um, in general, black has like a couple plans. Like you can try to push b5, you can play... Um, with e6 sometimes and then b5 as well uh, and then one day even playing for for c5 um i guess says i'm always a bit cramped when playing against d4 yeah i mean that that's what the d4 player is, is kind of playing for right a little bit of uh, space advantage um so how to get counterplay in this line let's let's think about this one um yeah, so a lot of players will play with like a6 and then go e6 here. Uh, bishop b2, knight d7, and then they play for uh, c5 in this kind of position. I'm not sure, again, about the theory here, but this is kind of one idea you can play for. Um, you can also play b5, where if they advance to c5, then you can play for your e5 break. So the thing about this structure is that what you're trying to do you're either playing for c5 or if they stop you and they play c5 themselves then you play for e5 right so you got to get some kind of pawn break um i think this is quite reasonable a lot of players also like getting their bishop out so they'll play bishop g4 here and then on h3 they'll just give up their bishop and i think this is uh this is totally playable because um, you give up the light square bishop and then you play e6, you go knight bd7, and then you don't feel as cramped. Yeah, so if you are trying to trade pieces, I would say bishop g4 is a better way to do it. Because you just get rid of this bishop and then you put all your pawns on light squares. <laughs> it's actually a very simple approach and all your pieces kind of get a natural square to go to. So your knight goes to d7, your other knight, you can reroute this one. Uh, in many cases to like d6 and then you'll play for like a6 and b5 on the queen side and basically you're just trying to keep the position very closed and you're playing against white's two bishops um, and i actually like this for black i mean I, I don't think black is better but i think you have a very solid and, and stable game so if that's what you're looking for like something solid uh and, and stable then i would switch over to maybe like bishop g4 here you just give the bishop up and then you don't have to worry about the bishop always being stuck on, on c8. I mean, there are other ways of playing the position, but this is the one where you can just kind of solve your problems of space in a very simple way. Uh, and the one player I would really recommend uh, you to, to study and take a look at, if this is something you're interested in, uh, is Gadakomsky. Because he's like a big-time Slav player and big-time Grunfeld player as well. And uh, he would do this a lot. I, mean, he, I think he has like tons and tons of games in this these kinds of Slav positions where he just gives up the bishop, puts his pawns on light squares, and it's like super solid, but he also like wins <laughs> tons and tons of games with it. So he finds ways of outplaying white, you know, against the two bishops, using the knights, using the light squares, you know, maybe even playing f5 at some point if you want to get aggressive and, uh, and fighting for that e4 square. So very very solid position and then you can try to outplay someone in the long run as well speaking of the grunfeld if you are looking for something as black where you kind of have more activity then i think the grunfeld is a pretty decent opening 
Um, we go g6 here, knight c3, and d5. And you can play these kinds of positions that are more open. You've already traded off one minor piece. And you have very simple play here for black where you just castle. You go c5, knight c6, queen a5, rook d8. You know, bishop can come out to g4 at some point when the knight is on f3. And all your pieces like just come out and, and fight against white center. So these positions I feel like are also very healthy for black and might kind of suit your, your style. Um, yeah, Kamsky streams, I mean... I was more talking about his games, you know, you could try to look them up, like, on chessgames.com or, or, or in a database or something, <laughs> but, yeah, you could also try to catch him when he's streaming and, and see if he plays those kinds of positions um, on air. Okay, but let's get to the game. So, yeah, long story short, I'm not sure about this knight e4 move, just because when white takes on e4, um, a lot of times this pawn on e4 can become uh, kind of weak. But uh, let's let's keep going. So white takes on d5. We take on c3 so that we don't lose the pawn. Uh, take back. Now knight f6. Now I actually think you are just fine. In fact, maybe, um, maybe you could have even taken on c3 in this position, like not giving white a chance to uh, a second chance to take on e4, because you you do get to trade off one minor piece, which is very important, right, when you're fighting against the space advantage trading off a piece so that your other pieces all have decent squares. Now the other knight can replace it, go to knight f6, and okay, your position looks very solid. Um, okay, the way we got it is also totally fine. Knight f6, now I think you're you're doing quite okay, knight e4, looks like a very solid position. Um, bishop d7, knight c5, here we decide to take on c5, so I'm curious... How come you didn't want to take the bishop on c3? Did you, did you just feel like, oh, it's a bad bishop, and I shouldn't take it? Or what was the the thought process there? Because now maybe you could grab the two bishops, and you could <laughs> just take on c3, and then play something like e6 here, or bishop d7. And you're not necessarily uh, better here, but you have the pair of bishops, and uh, in the long run, these are going to be uh, quite useful for you. I don't know, just a possible decision, not necessarily the best one, but definitely we could have done this as black. I probably I probably would take, just, just speaking for, for myself, um, and then just try to use the, the two bishops in, in the long run. Um, but let's see what happens. So take, take, bishop c6, we trade these guys, queen d4 check, f6, f4, so now we, we get this battle for the five square, and black plays queen c7. Very good move. Very good move. Because now we're we're kind of forcing white to push f5. Queen e5, again, also a good move. Now this end game I like for black compared to the previous one that we saw in the other game. Here it, w there is reason to be optimistic for black because we have this nice structure and uh, these pawns in the center are quite seem quite good. So I, I would feel like black is slightly better here for sure. Um, white doesn't want the endgame though, plays rook e1. Now we just take on f5. Bishop f3. Or bishop d3, excuse me. Take on d4. E takes d4. Oh, and all of a sudden, hmm, we can't really hold the pawn anymore. Huh, that's so interesting. So we win a pawn, white goes bishop d3, we trade queens. Seems good, right? Just trading queens. But now we can't defend f5. And actually, we end up with like a bad bishop on c6. So it's kind of unfortunate how this all played out, because I actually thought black was doing quite okay, and now, now this one is kind of a problem. Because we don't have e6. So rook a8. It could have just taken on f5. Goes rook e6. King f7. Takes... And yeah, now now black is under some pressure here. Um, let's see how this endgame plays out. Ooh, we got f5. And okay, things are like back to equal, and we end up in this bishop endgame. All right, so we're going to go back. 
Bishop b5? Uh oh, where did I miss bishop b5, guys? At this point? Yeah, Eigen says they, they knew they made a mistake but couldn't find a better move in, in time. Yeah, we'll go back to it. I think there, there was an option. Well, here bishop b5, the problem is white uh, takes on e7 with, with check. And uh, so we, we lose the pawn back and then and then f5 is still, still hanging. Um, so... White gets the pawn back and then enjoys, yeah, good structure, right? So what should black have done? Well, I think at this point, it seems like the only move might have been e6. Just continuing to hold. And and now now you're th finally threatening to, to trade queens. Uh, now that you can defend the e6. So you can, you can trade here, here. And then you'll have like king of seven, and then if you hold on to the e6 pawn, then uh, then you keep your extra pawn. Whereas in the other line, once we get into the end game, then we're just losing material, so it's it's no good. Yeah, we can come back to this line for a sec, but basically, black's remaining pawns just are, are super weak here. So white has white has quite a big advantage here, quite serious. They can trade rooks. They can pull back rookie three. Um, but basically, even if, let's look at this structure for just a sec, just for fun. Um, we can say white has like two pawn islands, right? This is this is one island. Get my arrows here, and this is two. And black has a grand total of one, two. Double pawns don't defend each other, so double pawns count as uh, one island each. So this is like three, four, five, six pawn islands. So lots of pawn islands. <laughs> I don't know how many times I can say that more, but <laughs> basically, uh, yeah, weak structure, big advantage for white. Big, big advantage. Um, but let's go back. Yeah, it seems like maybe e6 was the only move at this point. And then, if White wants to, they can try to keep the queens on the board, which I think maybe they should, um, given that they're down material, and try to play against Black's king. Um, but here, okay, you have an extra center pawn, and I don't really... I think you're still fine. Like, your king can hide on h8, and your rook can cover on g7. So I don't think we're really getting mated here uh, as Black. But it, it did take uh, one more move of holding the tension. Um, let's go back a sec. So here, 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 here. No, I mean, we did the right thing. We, we took on f5, bishop d3, and then we just had to hold on to this pawn for just one more move. And and then we, we have a nice position. All right, but let's go through the end game because I feel like there was more, more intrigue. All right, so rook g8, we start improving our position. F5 is kind of unfortunate, but what to do? And now we got like two rooks on, I mean, the g-file actually like, see the thing is, it, it seems like black's bishop is bad. <laughs> that's, that's simple to understand because it's like blocked by its own pawns. But on the other hand, white's bishop cannot defend these pawns. So a lot of times like you can get counterplay against the good bishop, because the bishop can't actually defend the d-pawn. So this is like, sometimes these positions can actually turn turn sour for white. Um, so rook f2, bishop d7. Yeah, I would have actually just went active. I would have just played rook g4 and just asked white, like, how they're going to defend this one. Because this, this is as serious of a weakness as e6. They're both just very, very huge targets. And so we definitely have the right to just uh, poke it and, and see what white wants to do. Probably goes rook d2, I would imagine. But then the rook is like much more passive than, than before. It's not like breathing down your neck on the f file. You don't have to worry about e6. You don't have to play a move like bishop d7 here. Um, your counterplay is holding off white's counterplay. Hopefully that makes sense. By keeping your rook active, you are preventing white from like doubling up his rooks 
and putting pressure on e6. So I'm guessing you're probably low on time here already because this is a rapid game. So don't feel bad, obviously. I'm not trying to like harp on you, but <laughs> uh, the lesson here is that when we start to kind of defend passively, um, that's when the position might start sliding. And, and check this out. Immediately white plays h3. He recognized most likely that rook g4 was going to be annoying. And so he just nips it in the butt. And you're like, no, you're not, you're not getting that, that square anymore. Um, so that's kind of, uh, that's kind of an interesting moment. Okay, rook g3. I think we're still actually okay here as black, despite having the bad bishop, um, you have a very nice and active rook. Um, so rook f3, and then we trade rooks, and I'm not sure about this one. I mean, objectively, I have no idea what's happening. Maybe it's, maybe it's a draw, maybe white is better. Um, but, but those are the only two results possible. And I think... I think, I don't know, my feeling is like it would have been more practical to just keep the rook on the board, like rook uh, g8 or something, just pulling back. My feeling is because we're the ones with the bad bishop, we probably want to keep rooks on the board. And that's kind of following just like general principles. I'm not like a huge endgame expert. I don't know 100% for sure. I'm just telling you how I would approach the decision in my own game. Uh, and I would feel like with the bad bishop, only I can lose if we get a bishop endgame, right? The nightmare would be if white's king is able to walk in on the dark squares. If this happens, then we will lose for sure. Um, but if rooks are on the board, this is very unlikely to happen because you're going to go rook takes g2, rook takes bishop, <laughs> and white will never get there in time because your rook is going to be um, active. So it sounds like we were, we were thinking draw, but... I would advise you against trying to, because it's not a draw, right? It's it's equal. It's not a draw. You don't draw the game until the clocks are stopped, right? What is a draw? A draw is 50 move um, without a pawn, or 50 moves without a pawn move or a capture, right? Three time repetition, kings on the board, only kings, right? An equal position is not an automatic draw, far from it, right? Even very, very strong players can lose equal positions all day <laughs> because chess is a tough game so we got to make that distinction very very clear that an equal position is not the same thing um, as uh, a dead draw dan cruz there is still time to uh send games to uh chess dojo live on twitch i got two games coming up one from benjamin one from uh 17 and then if you want to uh send another one in you will be um oh no i got two more games actually from one from diagonal daddy and <laughs> apparatus so there is a bit of a line there is a bit of a line dan but i will do my best and if you guys don't get your game uh analyzed this week then there's always always next week um yeah unfortunately i get it is kind of a tough lesson but the the nice thing is that you get to learn from it and everyone else gets to learn from it um, so again, uh, if you lose a game, hopefully no one feels bad about it. If anything, a loss is like a useful lesson. And here you got to play high-rated player. I should mention Eigen is like 1680 going up against uh, someone who's always uh, almost 2000. So, you know, props for, for sticking it um, this far. And it's always, I think it's always hard to avoid exchanges against um, high-rated players. But uh, but yeah, we ha if we try to stay somewhat practical um then we can kind of understand okay we have a bad bishop let's keep the rook on the board with the rooks on the board we might have more chances for for counterplay with the rooks off the board maybe we hold it maybe we don't but we don't really have a lot of chances for counterplay like i don't see unless white grossly over pushes here it's hard to see how how black can really win this and and that's not a great spot to be in like objectively it, it very well could be a draw again i have no idea but um it's not the most position uh, to hold. And I can definitely see myself losing this to like a strong grandmaster, even though again, objectively, uh, it might be equals. Okay, so white starts improving the position, a4, b5, and uh, we're trying to keep everything blocked up. Bishop b5, king d7, and we, yeah, we, we hold steady. So if takes, then king can take probably, and white won't be able to make any progress. So this shows good, good understanding for sure. Like the king just can't enter. 
I like your move h4, actually. I kind of skipped over this one. Sometimes I do this as a strong player. <laughs> I skip over good moves because to me it's like, oh yeah, h4, of course. <laughs> so, but actually, hold up. Like, you had not a lot of time. h4, very, very good move. I mean, you have to play this one uh, probably immediately, right? Even if white, if white gets a chance to play h4, then this is... Because two things, actually. If white gets to play h4, then this is always going to be a target. And that's going to be a problem. You don't want to have too many um, too many uh, targets to defend. And the other thing is that white can try to walk in. So if, God forbid, the king ever gets to h4, then you're going to have huge, huge problems. So you definitely want to play h4 before then. Okay, sounds like a silly blunder ended, ended this game. Well, okay, I mean, it's understandable. We have, we're probably down on time playing on the increment. So let's see what happens. So here, 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 we hold steady, hold steady, hold steady, bishop b5, king d8, here, bishop a6. Oh, we took it. Oh no. <laughs> what happened? You must have had, I know you had at least five seconds. So did you think your opponent just blundered or... <laughs> You're like, oh, he mouse slipped. Now's my chance. <laughs> or, or what happened? Was it just total, total panic? I mean, we've all done it. I'm sure I've done much worse myself many times. Well, at this point, the right move was just bishop c6, just holding the pawn. Because this is white's kind of one trick. <laughs> of course, if we take, then we can push. If we take on a4, then white takes on b7, and, and these pawns will... Uh, will promote um, so it'll be it'll be too too much Eigen says I was already tilted before this move what does that mean though I don't quite why would you be tilted and and what does that mean for for the game oh you're right actually yeah black could have taken on a4 but probably the players were blitzing so we'll give them a, a break on that especially if we're like uh, pre-moving here um, but yeah, I'm curious about this. Why were we, why were we tilting in in the game? Yeah, I mean we held solid. I mean against high rated player. Huh, interesting. So I thought it was a draw and made a draw offer. Ah, but Eigen, you gotta understand, you're playing someone who's 300 points higher rated than you. The position could be a dead draw, but that doesn't mean <laughs> that they're gonna accept. And I, I mean, I wouldn't accept either in this position as white, because we have to understand that just because an engine can hold a position and says it's equal, doesn't mean that it's the same thing for a human. Uh, and, and here white 100% has, you know, the moral advantage here. And the reason for that, just so I can explain it, is like, it's because it's very difficult for white to blunder in this position, right? He just has, the only way white can lose this is if he hangs the bishop, or if he hangs something, if he hangs a bunch of pawns, like if he hangs the a4 pawn, and then somehow he like, <laughs> then somehow he doesn't take on b7, and then he hangs the h3 pawn, he can lose, or like if he hangs the bishop, he can lose, but that's, that's very, very unlikely, especially against a strong opponent. But black, black has many ways to lose this. If your bishop is not on c6 at exactly the right moment, of course white will break through, right, with your weakness on, on b7. Um, I think this is White's only only real breakthrough idea. So this is the one you have to pay attention. But if you're not on it, if your bishop is is not defending, then then White will have some some chances. So the thing is, it's like only Black can really mess this up, um, and and that's why these end games are so tough. Exactly what you're saying because you are playing under time pressure for many moves already, and that's what happens. That's exactly what happens, and that's why we want to avoid these kinds of endgames, for the most part. I understand this one we probably could have held, like, with just a little more, like, a little more energy. But a lot of times what happens in the endgame is, like, it starts off equal, and then you're fine. You know, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine, you're fine. But it's like, you have to make a lot of moves, and then the time keeps ticking down. And it is a lot of pressure, right, the whole time, if you're playing on the increment, it's a lot of pressure to just continually not blunder. And we're all human, right? We're all human. We're not engines. So you're not just going to continually, like, you give a lot of these positions to any human, like, they're not going to be able to just play for a thousand moves, perfect chess, right? At some point, you know, you might crack. 
some positions are easier than others. Some positions you just have like a fortress and there's no way you can lose. You're just literally pre-moving back and forth and you can't lose it. But other positions, it's like you need to show some care. You need to defend against some threats. You need to make sure your opponent is not breaking through. And even again, if objectively it's a draw, that doesn't mean anything as far as whether we're going to make a draw. I mean, I lose good end games all the time. I lose equal end games. I lose like winning end games. You know, time pressure is a monster, right? It gets everybody. So, so this I think is a is more of like a practical lesson. Like chess wise, I don't think you did anything really like terribly wrong in this game. Like it's like it's like a pretty solid game actually, chess wise. But in terms of the decision making, um, it could have been uh, better at at a couple points. Mainly this this rook trade. I think this was maybe the biggest practical mistake we made. Um, even starting with, uh, with rook g3, I think might not have been necessary. I think it was fine trading off one pair of rooks, but then the idea has to be to try to keep this rook as active as possible. So this was the moment where we shouldn't have, um, traded rooks after rook f3. And then also, I think we should have been in a little bit more active mindset here, uh, and immediately find this rook g4, forcing white to go passive, and then you're the one with, like, uh, putting pressure. For example, let's say rook d2, you play h4 here, white goes h3, now you go rook g3, and now if white takes your rook on g3, well you can take with the rook, you can also take with the pawn and leave white with, with a really kind of like weak position on, on his king side. This pawn on g3 might be really painful. I don't know, you might be able to take with the rook as well, and now you're in like a much more uh, active position. Okay, and then what happens if white plays rook to d3? Well, probably we don't trade rooks here. Either we pull the rook back, um, or actually, I don't know, maybe you can trade the rooks like this or something, you know, like getting, you know, if your king gets active, actually, hold up, hold up one sec. Let's analyze this. Take, let's take this way. White starts bringing in the king. Oh, you play bishop b5 check. Yeah, look at these weaknesses. Now white is the one that has to all of a sudden take care of all these weaknesses. This might easily just be winning for black. Like you go e5, you break, you go king e6. Now you're the one with the pass pawn. You're the one with the good bishop. You're the one with targets. So yeah, this end game, it's not like you always have the bad bishop in this end game. You can find a good version of this as well. But it always starts with like, with the active mindset. So you always want to be very, very active in end games, especially if you think you're uh, under pressure. So hopefully that uh, makes sense. I hope I wasn't too harsh on you there. Um, but I think it can be an instructive lesson for, for everybody. I think it was a really uh, a really useful game. Okay, we have a bunch of games um, to get through. Let's go to Benjamin. Okay, next game. So we're playing black here. Whoa, b5. Benny Ben, b5. Is this what we're doing? <laughs> this is our our favorite opening, I take it. Do you also play b4 with white? <laughs> huh. I see. All right, let's see what happened. Okay, sharp game, sharp game. And eventually, eventually it was a draw. No, nothing wrong with uh, with the orangutan. I'm just, I was just curious. <laughs> I do think there are better options. Okay. I do think that this is not not the best move black can play. Um, because we're not really fighting for the center, you know. So e4, I think white is just better here. But okay, um, leaving the opening aside, because I actually I also believe that like pretty much all openings are playable. So if this is what you want to do, I, I think more power to you. I think it's fine, um, and and we can make it work. So a3, um, a5. There's also something to be said about taking. 
and kind of leaving white with the, this pawn here. But actually, I don't like opening up the B file, so that might come back to to bite us. So A5, that's fine. Take take. I, I'm not I'm not the orangutan expert, so <laughs> you you guys probably know what you're doing. Um, C5, Bishop D3. Okay, to me, all these moves look reasonable. Knight D7. Oh, knight c4. Okay, Benny, we had the chance here to take on f3. What did you think about this one? Maybe weakening uh, white structure. Now, you might know more theory, Benny, in, in these positions, but... My take is that, look, look at the position you got, right? It's not exactly the uh, the knight earth. You know, it's not exactly these sharp positions where knowing a lot of theory is helpful. White well, can play, you know, normal moves here and just get, like, the perfectly reasonable um, position. So, I don't, I don't know. I think the theory doesn't really take us very far. It's going to be more about uh, how we play. But it also means, I mean, again, all openings are... Or doable but yeah what do we think about this one uh, maybe just taking on f3 weakening white's king side and then just trying to play against this king side um, you can try for like queen c7 you can even play a move like knight e8 um, like this is a kind of a weird possibility but like okay actually sorry we're hanging the h7 pawn let's try queen c7 And then maybe you want to play like knight d5 at some point. Um, just a suggestion. I'm not sure if this is best, but like maybe knight d5. And then the king is a little bit weak. Aha. Yeah, it's not always good to take on f3. Yeah, don't get me wrong. Definitely this, you don't want to do this in just like every chance you get. But sometimes, sometimes it can be good because like you do get a clear target. Um... Because basically you're playing on the dark squares there. Like you take on f3 and then you try to play on the dark squares. Queen c7, knight d5, this kind of thing. Knight f8, knight g6. Um, this is like a pretty typical plan that we try to get once we take on f3. Bring the knight here, here, and then go after some of these squares as well. But just a thought. Again, just an idea. Something I would consider. Um... So yeah, then we get kind of a solid position, except here, e5, we end up losing uh, a pawn. And I'm not sure if this was, this was our intention or not, um, because at this point, we could take on c5, right? What was, what was the problem here? I think if we take on c5, we're, like, absolutely fine. I mean, we can even argue we have some pressure here as black, like rook c8. Maybe an interesting moment to discuss. What what happened here, Benny? What, uh, did we miss c takes d6, maybe? Because that allows white to, to win the pawn or, or something else. And David's the one that's like, you should play every opening. But I think he would also say that F3 is not an opening. It's not like a real opening. <laughs> okay, I guess you just missed it. I mean, that, that's fine. I mean, I'm not, uh, not here to... To criticize you, I'm just trying to understand what exactly happened. Because there's a difference between, you know, let's say you made a mistake, like you just didn't realize you can take on c5, versus, you know, like you saw that, but actually you wanted to play e5, you know, because you wanted to sack the pawn and, and look for some compensation. That would be kind of like a different thing. Because then it would say like, oh, okay, well, right, you knew what you were doing, but you just didn't like evaluate it correctly. Um, but it looks like it was just more like a tactical miss, which, which is fine. Um, so 
e5 takes, takes, we go queen c6, we're still, we're still in the game, we can still play for um, some pressure here, and then when it goes e4, we take, bishop takes, take here, bishop takes h7, and white keeps the, uh, the extra pawn, but we have, get some pressure, bishop e4, check, take, oh boom, we got the pawn back. Yeah, I mean, White didn't uh, didn't have to give the pawn back, but you did get it back. <laughs> so, so I guess this move, Bishop e4, is probably the not the most um, accurate for White. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you win the pawn back by force, if if that was what you were asking. <laughs> but you did the right thing here. I mean, you you. Look, you're down a pawn, but it's not like game is over, right? So you, your job at this point is just to, to put pressure. And that's what you did, rook c8. And now it's up to white to convert the position. And it's really not easy. I mean, one extra pawn is literally the least amount of extra material you can have, right? So it's like, it's enough in many positions to win with an extra pawn. But many positions are very complicated. And this is a position with a lot of long range pieces. So one thing to think about, it's like, it's queens and bishops and, and a rook on the board, no knights on the board, all like long range pieces. So this game is going to be like very dynamic and it's going to be hard for white to like push the pawn up the board and and have it like make a real difference. So I, I would argue that this position is very difficult for white to actually um, to actually make a lot of progress in. And the game kind of shows that white immediately goes wrong, bishop e4. Now we find queen c5 check. And uh, very accurately, bishop takes e4. Very good move. Because our queen is hanging, right? It's not easy to make this move. It's kind of tactical, but it's very important because if we took on c3, then we would be losing the bishop on a8. So this was good calculation with bishop takes e4. Takes, takes, rook d1, bishop c5, trading bishops. Oh, and then this is where white gives checks. Bishop f8. And now it looks very close to equal. We just gotta watch out for the bishop coming in, and it looks like we're we're absolutely fine. The game was drawn. I mean, yeah, like pretty solid game actually. I want to ask you, uh, Benny, how how much time would you spend uh, per move here? Because I know it was like one day per game. It was a correspondence game, um, but I'm curious how how much time would you spend. Uh, analyzing the game or, or you know thinking about what you're gonna do or, or what have you oh apparently there were some take backs in this game that's funny why were there take backs did someone mouse slip or something very sportsmanlike game props for that two take backs accepted in this game <laughs> You guys are, are nice to each other. Okay, while Benny's answering, I'm going to get the next game ready. And uh, next one, so guys, I'm, I am trying to just follow based on um, who sent it in. Um, so next one is going to be 17. And then if we have time after that, it's going to be... Um, apparatus and diagonal daddy so you guys are you guys are on deck oh this is from the dojo rapid championship sweet <laughs> That's awesome. oh you guys both had an answer three to five minutes i see um cool 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 yeah maybe maybe i would advise you to spend uh maybe a little bit more time just because like in a classical game you know you sometimes can get into really deep things um but uh, yeah, good luck, Benny. Hopefully that was a useful, useful analysis. Um, NVM, uh, I mean, we're probably not going to get to your game at this point because there's like maybe five, six people in line. Um, but uh, the normal way to submit games would be to whisper to Chess Dojo live. Um, and then that's how I would, I would see the game on my end. Um, but if you don't get in tonight, I'll be doing this show every Thursday, and so you can uh, try to come by next week, submit early, and uh, yeah, hopefully get a chance uh, next time. Yeah, absolutely.
Uh, okay, let me bring up this next game. And of course, guys, I mean, the idea is to like learn from everyone's game, you know, <laughs> as you all understand. Um, nice, nice. That's, that's great to hear. Okay, so next game we are playing white against Mitch. And I know Mitch, <laughs> so it'll be hard to, uh, uh, to play against him, but we'll see, we'll see. All right, so we're playing Nimzo, F3, Castles, E3. Okay, so transposing back into the E3 Sicilian. Uh, honestly, not my favorite line from White's point of view. I feel like this one is kind of uh, difficult to play. But uh, let's check it out. So Bishop D3, E5. Bishop e3. So far, I think normal. Uh, knight e2. Black goes knight h7. We go castles here. And now f5. Ah, so this was Black's idea. f5. So maybe, maybe we should have thought about knight g3 at this moment. I'm just going to earmark this move. Knight g3. Maybe we could have considered this one. But let's go. Let's just see what happened in the game. So take, take. Queen b3. b6. Give the check. G3, take, take, knight e4, queen b5. Looks like we had some pressure here as white. D5, knight g5, bishop b4. He has queen e8, we don't win the exchange. But yeah, position was looking really, really good. Rook e7. Wow, okay, <laughs> our back rank is covered. But 95, oh, things all of a sudden get super sharp. Okay, we get out of it. We're still somewhat better. Takes on B4, Rook endgame. And now, um, yeah, it looks like things peter out into a drawn Rook endgame. Yeah, h5 is fine. You can definitely play h5 here. Um, all you need to do is just keep your rook on uh, the b file, especially once black has committed to b2. This is now a very easy draw. A lot of you guys in the chat probably know this, but yeah, with the rook behind the pawn, the king can't really do anything. Once the king comes up to try and defend the pawn, you simply give checks from a distance, and the king can't hide. And this rook on b1 is, of course, stuck the whole time because it has to defend the pawn. So at this point, yeah, it draws uh, very easy for white to achieve. And, okay, you demonstrate your, your checks. And then, yeah, exactly right. King e5, you just go back. Rook b8, you just keep your fortress. You don't have to do anything special here. Um, okay, black goes after the uh, the h-pawn. I mean, I think the easiest thing would have been to do with take here, probably. And then... Um, Black has to be careful they don't get mated here, but okay, you can just go back. Now you have your own pass pawn, and yeah, black has to agree to a draw here. But uh, yeah, we give check, also fine, also fine. And uh, yeah, we're just drawing this one um, by, uh, by a wide margin. Cool, okay, so let's go back. So yeah, somewhere we kind of uh, blew our advantage. Now one moment maybe in the opening, we could improve is to play knight g3 here because this just kind of makes it hard for black to play f5 because he can't go g6 either with this pawn hanging so i'm not sure what black's next move is like if queen h4 we just castle and uh, f5 is still not really possible maybe g6 now to prepare f5 but I don't know, this queen on h4 doesn't strike me as, as being super um, stable. Like we have bishop f2 ideas, and some queen e1 ideas, and this kind of thing. So, I don't know, maybe this was black's idea. Um, though, I, I, yeah, it feels fishy, queen d2. So maybe that was a small improvement, but okay, castles, f5, that's more of an opening thing. I'm definitely not an expert in this line. Um, so I can't really say for sure, but that might be, yeah, a possible way. So f5, takes, takes. And then actually, I really like how you play this part because you're able to, to get an advantage. You get your knight to e4. And um, 
queen b5, very annoying move. Take, take. Now bishop d2. Knight goes knight e6, d5. Knight g5, bishop e4. Yeah, I think this was all great. Here. Take. And... We take the rook. We could have also taken with the pawn. I'm sure you consider this as well. I don't know. I mean, it's hard to say. I think I think both are probably good. This one is nice because if you're able to push the pawn to e5 and e6, then that's obviously very strong. And maybe you just put your bishop on c3 and make it happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just to go back a sec, uh, when black goes knight h7, if we just take two seconds to think about what he wants to do, right, it's either knight g5, which doesn't feel, doesn't kind of feel right, like what is it attacking, or f5. And then f5 actually is quite a reasonable idea for black. And then, okay, your knight usually goes to g3, I imagine, in these positions anyway, so, right. Seems like that would have been, would have been interesting. Um... Okay, but going back to the game, yeah, this was a really interesting decision, like what to take on e4 with. Uh, and now that we're low on time, of course, now, yeah, the game gets <laughs> game gets very complicated, as as usual. Um, rook takes is also natural, just because you you fight for the open file. So I definitely don't think this is a I definitely don't think this is a bad decision. I just think pawn takes maybe maybe would have been more ambitious if you can get e5 and e6 and. So here, here, um, rookie seven, take, take, here, here, and then check here. Yeah, I guess at this point we're kind of, um, we're kind of blitzing. Yeah, it turns out, I, I mean, it, it feels like it was just more of a concrete decision because like, okay, rook takes, it looks good, like you get your rook to e7, but as it turns out, after knight f6, like, black is fine. He's able to trade, take on d5. So there's no real way to, like, evaluate this, if that makes sense. It's not like, from afar, a strong player would be able to figure out, like, oh, pawn is on d5, you know, we got a knight on h7, oh, should be equal. This is just, like, a concrete situation where, yeah, you know, if you believe in your rook, right, you just go rook e7 and, and you try to cause damage and, and it's up to black to defend. And in this case, concretely, he's able to kind of defend thanks to this queen d4 check, knight d5 idea. Without this one, it might be a little bit tough, I don't know. But um, yeah, basically it comes down to these like complications. So the, the bigger story here is like, <laughs> there are going to be complications no matter what. And that means that you should be trying to just make the best moves you can. If that invites complications, so be it. Um, there are cases where you want to be like kind of more practical. But I don't know. I mean, I think in, in this case, it's like taking with a pawn. It does feel nice. I understand, of course, you had low time. So when we have low time, we, we're allowed to make whatever decisions. You know, as long as you don't flag, right? Anything's better than, than flagging. Um, but... But okay, maybe just an instructive moment to learn from because suddenly we get the pawn rolling and we have, it's, it's all of a sudden it's not really concrete. If anything, this is actually less complications because here we're kind of in control. Like black doesn't have any uh, immediate ways of uh, simplifying or stopping us and we're just continually uh, building up here. Bishop c3, e5, e6, and, uh, and this kind of thing. So hopefully that makes sense. Hey, Twitchbot with the bits. Unfortunately, these go to the channel <laughs> and not to me. But um, thank you. I'm sure they're very appreciative. Um, no, I don't. I wouldn't say it was conceptually wrong. Uh, that's a good question. I'm glad you're asking. I would say here after F takes E4, uh, your advantage to me is more. Um, is more obvious because your e pawn is a very strong pass pawn, um, and you just have like this strategic advantage because you have this very strong e pawn. If it gets to e6, it's like a protected passer, and you have this like bishop on the long diagonal that's really good. Whereas after rook takes e4, 
your advantage is more dynamic and sometimes dynamic advantages just don't play out or you know you have to be very very precise to capitalize and in this case I don't really see actually what maybe instead of rookie seven again maybe rookie seven is simplifying you could play rookie five here and you're still better you definitely have an advantage in this position um, but then this again becomes more of like a static advantage like you're just kind of trying to keep uh, your your pressure um, so fe4 you have a very static advantage here because I just think your pawns are strong whereas after rook takes e4 you're playing for a more dynamic advantage especially with a rookie seven you're trying to like win the game immediately but uh, but it just doesn't it just doesn't work out concretely yeah which you know is ultimately out of your control uh, again, I'm not. I'm not trying to say it's. It was a, a bad decision to take with the rook. I think in a blitz game, um, five times out of ten, I would take with the rook. Five times out of ten, I would take with the pawn. <laughs> it kind of looks like fifty-fifty, to be honest. Like on any random day, I don't know. I might take with the rook. Might take. When you're low on time, you know, you don't really know. But the instructive part is just to analyze these decisions, and then maybe next time, you know, it might have slightly different elements, and you're kind of better oriented. Maybe you were underestimating uh, the pass pawn a little bit. I'm not sure. Um, my first instinct was definitely to take Fe, um, if that is is useful at all, just to get the the pawn, the pawn rolling. And here, I mean, if Rook takes F1, I think we just take with the Rook here, and that uh, we keep our Rook active, uh, and we try to go, like Bishop C3 next move, and then E5. We're basically just playing for this construction, the rook f7 uh, at the end, this kind of thing, e5, e6, bishop, bishop c3. But yeah, really interesting game overall. I would say um, this line is, is <laughs> can get quite sharp. Um, and then this was definitely, I think, the right approach. The c5 break was very important to get rid of this weakness and actually leave black with some weaknesses. Uh, of his own that you can you can target now with like rook ad1 ad4 and this kind of stuff so yeah yeah interesting game mm. maybe maybe underestimate past bonds could be uh totally possible i know from from experience working with students a lot of times like we're analyzing a game and my student has like a strong past bond and then they're like very casual about it. They're like not trying to push it, not trying to promote it. And I'm like, you know, you just make two moves. Like the pawn promotes, you win the game. And they're like, oh. <laughs> or like they misevaluate positions with a pass pawn where they don't quite realize uh, the, the strength. I think actually it's kind of a common thing not to um, not to fully appreciate. Cause, because sometimes pass pawns, they can feel like weaknesses as well if they're isolated. And so we might not always want to have a pass pawn, but... Once the, the further it gets up the board, the stronger it becomes in many, many cases. So definitely not something to be uh, underappreciated. All right, 17, thank you for the game. Hopefully that was useful. Uh, I think we're going to have time for one more here. So let's go to Operitos. Okay, Operitos, you are actually, you're going to need to send me the link to this game, please. If you're in the chat, let me know real quick and send me the link because the full PGN, there's not enough room for all of the moves. So I only have the first uh, 20, 27 moves or so in this game. Looks like an interesting game. Bogo Indian, D6, Knight B1, wow. Yeah, it looks like an interesting game, but I need the link to the game. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to the next person. <laughs> so please... Please let me know. Oh, there you are. Yeah, if you can, if you can send me the link, the link to the game. That would be the best. Was this, uh, or was this an OTB game? Oh, this was Icarus 2018. Oh, this was over the board game. Oh, man. Uh oh, wow. <laughs> this is OTV. Um, hmm. How about this? I'll load, I'll load the game in and you can let me know 
what happened uh, once we run out of moves. Oh, that didn't work. Okay, let's try again. He didn't like something about the info. Wow, guys. Imagine this. This was a game played in person. Can you guys believe that? Not online. Like with a, no computers were involved, hopefully, in this game. <laughs> no devices, no electronic devices of any, of any kind, for any reason. They were playing on a physical board. Man, it's not letting me load the game. Alright, I'm just going to input the game manually. <laughs> How did he do that? <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, for the future, everyone is allowed to uh, submit the game. Oh, I got the Lee Chess link. Thank you. Thank you so much. This will work. Beautiful. Oh, right. The clock was electronic. That's true. I mean, not necessarily, but... <laughs> Okay, so here um, our hero is playing white, and uh, looks like we lost this game. That's okay. Thank you for submitting. So Bogo Indian, g3, knight c6, um, bishop g2. Yeah, so this is actually this is actually a known thing in this position. I don't know if you're aware of this opening or not. Um, but uh, bishop g2 in this exact position is considered a slight inaccuracy because after bishop takes d2, uh, we don't really want to take with the knight. And in the game, actually, you play knight b1, very interesting, and bring it back to c3. So you recognize that your knight is better on c3 here. So yeah, we don't really want to take with the knight. And the problem with taking with the queen is that it runs into this um, knight e4 idea. Um, but the interesting thing, though, is that, like, so this is kind of old knowledge. I remember when I was learning the Bogo Indian, like, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I remember seeing this trick, and, and the point is after knight e4, queen c2, black has queen b4 check, and uh, white doesn't have, like, a great way to respond to the check, because if you go knight d2 here, uh, black takes on d2, and whatever way you take back with, one of these pawns is going to end up hanging. So if you go knight takes d2, then knight takes d4. And if you go queen takes d2, then queen takes c4. So, and, and it's like not great for white. We're losing a pawn. Um, and so if we go knight c3 here, then black takes on c3, and then we have to double our pawn. So this is also, um, this is also not, not the end game that white wants. We want this end game if our pawns were healthy, we have this nice bishop on g2, but we don't want this structure in this endgame. This would be no good. So this has always been annoying for white. Um, and yeah, like knight b takes d2, I think it's okay, but it's not ideal because we would rather just be able to, to put the knight on c3 in one move. But the interesting thing is that like uh, a few years ago, not that long ago, maybe like two years ago, uh, Shakriyar Mamadyarov, who's like, world number three or something at the time or maybe top five he played into this position making this like mistake he played queen takes d2 knight e4 he played queen c2 queen b4 check and then here he goes king f1 <laughs> and he he does this like relatively quickly actually i think this was in uh, some super tournament like white Conze. and it turns out it's actually not that bad. Like it's kind of, it's kind of playable. So who knows? Might have been like some new computer idea um, that he was like trying out. Um, but the point is like he doesn't trade anything. He doesn't lose anything. He keeps his center. Uh, he's gonna go like e3 at some point. Maybe a3 to kick kick the queen out. Uh, knight on e4 is hanging. So black of course has to figure out what to do. Like let's say d5 for example. Um, and then maybe white plays. Uh, like e3 and if queen takes c4 queen takes c4 pawn takes we go knight d2 takes takes this is just a sample line 
all of a sudden, like, we're winning back uh, the pawn because we're hitting the c4 pawn, the bishop is on the diagonal, and basically it's like a perfect Catalan. I don't know if you've played the Catalan opening, but essentially this is like a very, very good version. Um, uh, Angelos, one thing I don't know about you is your approximate uh, ELO rating and the rating of your opponent. That would just be useful to know, just so we get a, a context for the game. I don't want to fill your head up with opening lines if you're like, <laughs> you know, just uh, just started out. <laughs> um, yeah, I know exactly. I wouldn't play this either unless uh, unless I I would prepare it uh, myself. But it is something that uh, it is something like actually may, maybe worth playing, maybe worth exploring. Like if a super GM thought it was playable then uh, for sure it's interesting for us. And this is kind of a nice idea. Black goes d5, e3, and um, queen takes c4. We just trade queens. We get this endgame. We win the pawn back, and now it's actually good that our king is on uh, f1 because the king actually gets into the, the center very quickly, which is kind of nice in this endgame. So this is kind of a good thing. Anyway, long story short, the classic way of dealing with this line is to play knight c3 in this position. So you avoid this whole trap with bishop takes d2 because once again there's no ideal way of taking on d2 here. So instead of what white uh, has been kind of taught to do is play knight c3. Black usually takes on c3 at some point, plays like knight e4, we go rook c1 here, then it's like knight takes c3, rook takes c3. You can certainly fight for an advantage in this position because you haven't weakened your structure, you still have the good bishop, you have a little bit of a space advantage, and, and you can say that you're slightly better here. Um, I should also note, you know, if you are looking for maybe a bigger edge, personally, I'm a fan of the knight d2 lines, because um, this allows you to fight for the two bishops. You play a3 here, and you encourage black to take, and then they give up the bishop without losing, uh, you get the bishop pair without weakening your structure, like in the Nimzo Indian. So I've always been a fan of this one, because if they don't take, if they go back, then we're going to be pushing um, e4 and, uh, and getting uh, a lot of space. So this one, in my opinion, is a little bit more ambitious, but bishop d2, of course, is, is totally playable. Okay, so that's enough on the opening lecture. Let's, <laughs> let's go to the actual game. So knight b1, very interesting move, like you are able to improve your knight in time. And I would say here you have uh, a reasonable position, e5, d5. So we, we play e4 here, knight e4, castles, c5. c5 I'm not a fan of for black. I think black in these positions should play a5. So then on a3, you can bring your knight back to a6 and, and put it on c5. But I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. c5 might be fine. Um, what do I know? <laughs> Bishop d7, a3, knight a6, knight d3, b5. Actually, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I could be totally wrong. I feel like black ended up getting um, kind of a reasonable position here. Hmm. Maybe we needed to play like queen d3 and cover b5 this way, but yeah, it's hard to say. Okay, knight d3. C1, H5, B4. E2, T. Well, it looks like we end up getting pressure. And the C5 pawn is, is pretty weak. Wow, this game gets really crazy. F3. I love it. Opening up the rook. F4. Wow. And then black ends up getting counterplay in time, it seems. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, interesting game. Somewhere we were, like, uh, much, much better for white. I, I, I definitely feel that. And, um... 
Yeah, I noticed bishop f3. To me, it felt a little bit odd. Um, f3, we have to be careful because that runs into a queen e3 check, which could be unpleasant. That would be very spicy. Um, I don't know. Maybe take here. And then on like rook b8, you just go, go back. Or rook c2, something like that. I like rook c2 actually, because you can try to trade off the rook. Yeah. But yeah, blunder something under time pressure. I mean, this is, this is usually what happens <laughs> in sharp positions, you know. And then the question is, should we should we be trying to manage our time better earlier, or is there some kind of secret recipe to, to play better under time pressure? I, I imagine a lot of players... Um, oh, <laughs> my bad, sorry. <laughs> yeah, when white played f3, right, this was spicy. <laughs> I'm sorry, I misunderstood the chat here. That's that's my fault. YouTube's gonna be like so confused. Like, what is he talking about? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So, unfortunately, like everyone plays bad in time pressure. From what I've seen, like everyone is much more prone to blundering and plays worse. So, my thought process has always been that like I just try to avoid time pressure as much as I can. So. It doesn't mean I try to play fast, but I, I try to stay within range of my opponent and I try not to leave myself with um, low time. So this was Icarus open. I imagine, can you let me know what the time control is? I, I bet it was like, was it like uh, like 90 moves in, or 90 minutes for 40 moves and then like another hour or second time control 30 minutes or something. I imagine you usually get more time at move 40 in uh, open events. And around here where it's like move 30 and move 30 to 40 is always is always critical. Online players have like no idea what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> and, and over the board tournaments, you often get two time controls. You get your first time control in 90 minutes and you have to make 40 moves. Um, and uh, OK, so this was 130 plus 30. So, for this time control, both sides had to make 40 moves in the first 90 minutes. If they don't do that, they flag. After they complete 40 moves, then they get an additional 30 minutes after that. So it's like a total of two hours. Um, oh, no extra time after move 40. My bad. Never mind. Okay, so, so we're on 90 minutes from the start. So no second time control is a G90 plus 30 game. Okay, that's a bit more manageable, but that means that once you get down on time, it's hard to build up that time back because uh, you, you just never get that second time control, right? So in this kind of time control, it's important not to fall way behind, um, uh, way behind on the clock, right? Uh, because if you're down to like 20 minutes and your opponent has an hour, then that's just a big advantage for them. And as soon as the game gets complicated, like they have more time to think, you're of course gonna run into time pressure and it's really hard to play on the increment. Right, so there's 30 second increment, but once you get down to 30 seconds, it's hard to make that time up. You're basically just in time pressure for the rest of the game. Um, yeah, so, Right. I Basically, I try to avoid time pressure as much as I can. I just try to stay ahead on the clock uh, because my feeling is like pretty much everyone plays worse under pressure. And so if we can avoid that situation, that's kind of what we want to do. Um, but let's let's just talk about the game a little bit because I feel like <laughs> we didn't discuss the game uh, too much. I think you played it fine for the most part. Like to me, your, your moves here look quite reasonable. Um, I'm sure there was uh, moments for uh, improvements. 
Um, but here I like your position a lot because you have this structure now and you have this protected pass pawn. So I imagine you're doing well here. So question, how much time do we have at this point? Do you have any kind of um, recollection? This is like move 25. Are we down to like 10 minutes here? We still have something like 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour. Down to five minutes already, already playing on the increment. <laughs> I don't know, different players, sometimes, some players, they run low on time very, very quickly. Yeah, but I'm curious, what was the time like at at this moment, exactly, after, once we get this structure, D takes C5, because this is where White's compensation, or White's advantage, I think, kind of like crystallizes, because now you have this strong uh, D pawn, and you have this clear weakness um, to attack on C5. Okay, so 30 minutes around here, that's good. So that's that's a decent amount of time. Um, let's see what we do. We go queen d1, queen g5. Yeah, black gets a little bit active here. Um, bishop f3, f5, takes f6, d6. Yeah, he really starts taking a lot of risk with all, with all this stuff. Um, bishop c4 f3 check here rook h4 yeah so rook h4 this seems this seems like you're running very low on time and you just you have no idea what to do uh, cuz you go for this very slow plan like rook d8 rook c2 I guess trying to go over to the H file, but there's, yeah, maybe not much there. Um, so Rook H4, yeah, we really lose the thread here, right? Uh, I imagine you're down on time at this point. So this is the risk that we take when we go into very sharp positions <laughs> with low time. All of a sudden, we don't know what to do and how to how to orient ourselves, right? Like. It, I mean, it's very hard. I mean, especially this position, like it's is pretty sharp. Um, you you have a nice D pawn, and one thing we would think about is like, where do our pieces want to go? Um, Black's E pawn is also concerning. I like your bishop. Hmm. So my thought would be maybe like rook cc2 and then try to play like rook d2. Like on rook d8, we would go rook d2. It might run into some e3 stuff, so it's not like... It's definitely risky, but e3, we're always kind of counting on this bishop d3. So this is like one tactic I'm somewhat looking for. Like e3, bishop d3, knight e4, take, take, queen g4, check. Hopefully we get something against Black's King. Not really sure, actually. Um, oh, we wanted to push a G4. I see. Uh, but I don't quite get the idea. Let's say Black lets you push a G4. Can't he take on F4? Or what was... What was the justification there? Or were you trying to... Were you trying to prepare F4 still? Like you're going to go Queen D2 or... Or like rook over to f2 or something and then try to push g4. In that case, it's just a very slow plan. And and then black all black has to do is make one move like rook b8. And uh, black's threats are going to be like more uh, more annoying than, than white's threats. But this was a tough position. I, I, I really don't want to make it seem like it, it was obvious what to do here. Because it really isn't. Like, I, I would certainly struggle in this position as well, because it's just very unclear. Like, we can see both kings are weak. White's king is open. This d-pawn is strong, but it's also weak. This e-pawn is strong, but it might be no good. Yeah, queen d2 might be a uh, possibility here as well, or like preparing uh, the f4 plan. Um, in fact, maybe queen d2 is good, because like, if you can put your queen on e3 and somehow keep this pawn defended, that would be kind of a nice setup, but of course there's always tactics, right? There's always knight g4 and stuff, so it's like never easy to get exactly what you 
what you want. So this is kind of a tough position. Um, going back, seems like we um, well, we basically walked into like a very very sharp position, and um, yeah, I'm not sure if this was the right thing to do because well, Apparatus, you said it yourself. You felt like you were close to winning for positional reasons, right? Strategic reasons. So what are those strategic reasons? Like you have a strong deep on, you have potentially good bishop, right? Versus the knight. But then the way you played it is like you're winning for dynamic reasons is what you're claiming, right? You're playing for checkmate. Because f3, positionally speaking, very, very risky move, right? Because we're just opening up our king. So this is not the move of a player who thinks they're better positionally, <laughs> this is the move of a player who thinks they're playing for checkmate, right? And so you have to get it clear. Are you playing for positional domination or are you playing to checkmate the king? It's fine to play for checkmate, but then you have to be clear on what you're going for. And it might not be the right plan in the position. So maybe, maybe it's actually not fine to do this. Like if we go back, let's say in this position, you say like, hold up, I'm not going to play for mate. I'm just going to go after this weak pawn. I think you're still doing totally fine here. I mean, you can just put pressure on this one. And uh, from here, maybe your queen goes to d2. Maybe your queen or your bishop can swing around this way um, just to cover some of these squares if you need. Or you like, I like queen d2, and then maybe you're running like a4, a5, uh, queen d2, rook d1 as well. Basically, like start with rook c2, go after the c5 pawn. I don't know how black defends it or what they do. Maybe rick to d8 or something. Um, but yeah, here you have pressure. Uh, no, you you are right. Uh, they're saying that after f5, they felt like they lost some uh, advantage. Uh, you did lose some advantage, but it doesn't mean that it's over. <laughs> like, you're still playing for some pressure here. I mean, as long as black has weaknesses, you will always have you will always have something to, to, to play against. Uh, so it doesn't mean we have to, we have to, let's say, go go crazy, right? Starting to attack. Um, yeah, bishop f3 might have, of course, it kind of walks into f5. Uh, actually, I, you probably were here earlier for, for the previous game um, where, yeah, it was 17's game um, where his opponent played knight h7. He didn't quite anticipate that black's idea is to play f5. Here again, I don't know, maybe we could anticipate that this is what black wants to do. If we look at the position from, from black's point of view, and we just ask ourselves, I wish I could have an easier way of clearing these arrows. There we go. If we ask ourselves, what does uh, black want to do here? We're probably going to think of this move f5, like it's just so natural to open up the rook. So we do have to ask, ask the question, as much as we can during the game. It, it's something that's difficult to remember, but it's useful to, to try to do. What does my opponent want to do? Um, maybe that could even be the biggest takeaway from this game. It's like the importance of asking what does the opponent want and, and seeing if you can play against it. Um, now, is there a way to play against f5? I'm not really sure. I don't see how white stops f5, but bishop f3 certainly doesn't help because then your bishop kind of ends up... Um, as, uh, as a target on the f file. So yeah, maybe we could have taken on c5 here or gone something like rook d2, rook c2. I think rook ac2 also very, very natural as well. And uh, yeah, um, but interesting game and definitely not the uh, not the easiest position to, to play and a very interesting game to, to analyze. Um, yeah, well, all right guys. That's going to wrap it up for this show. Thank you to everyone who submitted games. Uh, if you did not get a chance, you will get a chance next week. I do the show every Thursday on uh, Chess24 at 3.30 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, yeah, you can catch the, this full episode and previous episodes of the show up on my YouTube channel. Uh, and you can find that by searching on YouTube.com. <laughs> so um, yeah, thanks to everyone who... Uh, tuned in and submitted games. Hopefully they were useful for, for everyone involved. Um, sorry, YouTube. I, I always get games from Twitch. Uh, and yeah, everyone's allowed to submit games, of course. Um, but uh, 
yeah, uh, hopefully I'll catch you guys uh, next week. This was uh, this was a lot of fun.